Okay, so uh, let's get started. Um, we are working our way through a history of the field. We looked last time at the two first experiments that took place in the mid-90s. And in lecture 8, in lecture 9, lecture 10, we're going to be looking at a series of experiments that have come to be known as minimal cognition experiments. And the goal of the minimal cognition experiments was to try and simplify the robot as much as possible to get it to do something other than just legged locomotion and manipulating objects. We're going to see a lot of running and jumping and manipulating objects. But obviously, we want to try and evolve robots that exhibit incrementally more sophisticated behaviors to the point where we might point at that robot and say it's starting to exhibit the various building blocks of intelligence. And in lecture nine today, we're going to look at four experiments where they evolved minimal robots to exhibit four of the building blocks of intelligence or cognition. But before we do that, we'll finish our discussion about CTRNNs today, which is a particular kind of neural networks used throughout the minimal cognition experiments, and actually used in a lot of the experiments we're going to see in the rest uh, of the, the course. Any questions about assignment five? No, we're all good? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so last time uh, we gradually added terms to these differential equations that describe the neurons in a neural network. And as we went along, we tried to build up an intuition for what all these different terms are doing in our differential equation. What does the, t what does the tau parameter do to our neurons? How does it alter their behavior? how much they react to a perturbance. Not how much they react, how but quick how quickly or how slowly they react. So by setting different values of tau for a given neuron, we can cause that neuron to react rapidly or very slowly to all the other things that are influencing how that neuron's value is going to change over time. These we've seen before. What are these? Our synaptic weights, right? So how all the other N neurons influence neuron I, right? So this is the weight that connects neuron J to neuron I. We've seen this activation function before. In this case, it's on the inside of this summation. And the reason why it's on the inside in this case is when we read out the value of any given uh, neuron, like reading out the value of neuron J, the output of neuron J is this whole thing here. So the internal value, this value that's changing over time, is y sub j here. But this whole term here, if we're reading it out, for example, and sending that value on to affect neuron i, we use this whole term here. And if we send that value out to a motor to control that motor, we're going to use this whole term here. What do the g's do? You can see we have g sub j. So this is the G parameter associated with neuron J. It's the gain, right? So it's the amplitude, it's the overall volume of that, that neuron, right? How, how much generally influences all the other neurons that it's connected to. What about the bias here? Again, we have theta sub J here. So it's the parameter associated with neuron J. tendency to either be inhibitory or excitatory. Exactly. So the bias is, is offsetting the default value of y sub j. So a positive bias means it tends to be excitatory. It has a positive value. A negative bias means y sub j tends to be negative, and it's inhibitory. OK. If we have a whole bunch of these differential equations, we have a whole bunch of neurons, we might pick a couple of neurons in the neural network and say, you're sensor neurons, and you're going to receive a value from one of the sensors uh, embedded in the robot. So if it's a sensor neuron, this might be set to 1 if a touch sensor fires and 0 otherwise. Uh, or this might be an angle if we have a proprioceptive sensor that's returning the angle of a joint. All the other neurons in the neural network that are not sensor neurons, they may be hidden neurons, 
or motor neurons. We just ignore this, this term. Okay, so uh, a seemingly complicated looking uh, equation for our neurons. These are def C tier and Ns are definitely more complicated than the simple A and Ns you were developing in assignments two and three. But they have very nice properties, and I'm going to show you an, uh, a robotics project in a moment that demonstrates the advantage of this kind of approach. But before I do, let's think about how we would go about actually evolving C tier and Ns. Let's say we have a neural network with 10 neurons. How many differential equations do we have? Ten. Ten. We've got 10 differential equations. And we want to evolve the parameters that describe this neural network. In assignments two and three, you were evolving the synaptic weights. But here, there are more than just synaptic weights that we're going to place under evolutionary control. What in this equation is being placed under evolutionary control? Not the Ys themselves. These are the neuron values, right? These are going to change over time once we embed our neural network in our robot. What's being evolved here? The weights for sure, right? Not, not unlike what you've done before. We have 10 neurons, so how many total weights are going to be evolved? 100, right? So 10 by 10. So we have, for every of each of the 10 neurons, we have 10 synapses that are arriving at that neuron. So we have a 10 by 10 weight matrix that's being evolved. What else needs to be evolved here? Are we evolving everything besides the Ys, uh, the fitness function, and maybe the I? We're evolving exactly everything except the Ys and the I, right? These are just the inputs to the neural network. So we're going to allow evolution to evolve the taus, so evolution can make the neurons respond more rapidly or more slowly. We're evolving all 100 weights, all the gains, and all the thetas. So you think about that data structure. How many total numbers is evolution going to be able to play with if we were evolving a 10 neuron CTRNF? So we've got 100 here, 110, 120, 130, right? So a total of 130 numbers when we're evolving CT, CT or NS. Okay, so what advantage do we get from allowing evolution to evolve or tinker with these other parameters other than the weights? And I'll show you an example uh, of this now. Okay, one of, the, uh, one of the biggest challenges in robotics at the moment is making generalists. So we have robots that are very good at doing one thing and doing one thing well, even AI programs. So we have an AI program that two weeks ago can now beat humans at, at Go. It's very good at playing Go, it's not good at anything else. Uh, it seems that in the not too distant future we're gonna have autonomous cars, which hopefully are good at driving, not very good at anything else. Right? We're able to make specialist machines, but how do we train robots to do more than one thing? Here's a, a project that attempted to investigate this. Here's a robot that was trained to manipulate this cube here, and it's going to exhibit what are called a number of motor simple actions, like you saw shifting this block left and right on the table. It can also find the block, pick it up, and shake it up and down three times, and then shake it left and right. Okay, so not again, not the most sophisticated robot you've ever seen. But this is actually a surprisingly difficult thing to do with robots. Teach them to do one thing, shake the block left and right. Teach them another thing grab the block and lift it up and down three times, and let's call those motor primitives A and B. Then tell the robot, execute A, then B. It's a difficult thing for the robot to do. Often when it learns B, it forgets how to do A or vice versa. It knows A, it knows B, it has a hard time putting these together, so it does A, then B, surprisingly difficult to do. Why is it surprisingly difficult to do? Well, let's have, a, let's have a look here. So here's a sort of 
behavioral trajectory of what the robot could do. So we could ask it to start in the home position, reach for the object, shake it up and down three times, shake it left and right three times, and then back to the home position. So we need to train it how to do all these little primitives, left and right three times, up and down three times, forward and back three times. In this little cartoon down here, let's imagine that these different colored squiggles correspond to these different motor primitives, these simple things that we're training the robot to do. Here's one way we could teach the robot to do it, which is to create a neural network where you have separate subnetworks, and you train one network to allow the robot to lift the block up and down. Okay, we've got that in one part of the robot's brain. Then we take another part of the robot's brain that's separate and use that to train uh, left and right, and then a third part of the brain forward and forward and back. Okay, so different parts of the brain uh, learn or evolve the ability to exhibit these different motor primitives. Then we have some gates that connect these subnetworks to the actual motors themselves. So if we open gate one, then the motor commands from this network flow to the motors and the robot shakes the object up and down three times. Turn off this gate, open this one, and now it does the other action and so on. If we were to create a neural network like this and train each part of the network to exhibit each of these different tasks, we could do it. We could get a robot to learn A and B and C, and then if we asked it to perform A then B, it would be able to do it. Great, no problem. What's the problem with this approach, however? Did you have an idea? Effort, Sorry? Computational effort. Computational effort, how so? Okay, so there's some computational effort issues here. What else is problematic about this approach? Yeah, it's really not much different from just going in and programming separate functions for doing each thing. Which, again, we could do. It doesn't have to be a neural network. We could just write functions and train those functions or program them by hand. So what? Like, this is not adaptable. It's not? It's just as not general as that. It's not as general. Why is this not very general? It's general in the sense that it's got these three motor primitives learned or evolved. For each new task you want to teach it, you have to build a new neural network. For each new task you want to teach the robot, you're going to have to add another sub-network, right? You can do more than three things, right? Depends on how you count, but you can probably do trillions of different things. It's unlikely that there are tr trillions of different subnetworks in your brain all dedicated to one and just one, one thing, right? It's not a very scalable approach. It's unlikely that nature would, would use that, that approach. Okay, so this would allow a robot or an animal to learn different things and then stitch them together in different sequences, but not very scalable. So let's try and create a different approach to this problem. Let's imagine that we have a tangle of fast neurons here, and they're fast in the sense that you can see they're changing quickly over time. And then let's imagine you have another tangle of neurons over here, and these neurons are slow, so they only change their value slowly. You can think of these, and imagine there's a few connections between the tangle of fast and slow neurons. You can think of the slow neurons here as sort of the, um, uh, a conductor who's slowly changing the direction of the orchestra, and each member of the orchestra is doing their thing on their, their instrument. Okay, let's imagine, again, following this cartoon here, that when one or a few neurons in the slow set has intermediate values, or there's some particular settings of the slow neurons, they push, quote unquote, the fast neurons into a particular pattern, which might correspond to lifting the block up and down. And then slowly, as the slow neurons shift to a different value, that pushes the fast neurons into an, a different 
separate pattern which corresponds to motor primitive B. Make sense? So the, the conductor, so to speak, is holding a certain value and that's causing a particular melody from the orchestra. When they change slowly, when the conductor changes to a different value, that pushes the neurons into a different melody and away we go. Okay, what's the advantage of this approach? Right, so the slow neurons can be adaptive and so can the fast ones. So the fast neurons here, at one point in time, they're exhibiting the red behavior. At another point in time, the same fast neurons are exhibiting a different fast pattern. And at a third point in time, the same neurons are exhibiting a third different pattern. What's the main advantage here? compared to the approach we were just talking about. Can you just train like the slow neurons instead of having to retrain all the fast ones? So you can train, once, once you've trained these neurons over here to exhibit A or B or C, then we can train the slow ones to exhibit different patterns which will correspond to what? If we train the slow neurons to do something else, and these, these guys over here can do A, B, or C, what's going to happen? Like new combinations of the motor primitive. Exactly, right? So in essence, over here, we could ask the slow neurons, we could ask the conductor, give us A, A, B, C, A, B, A. Go to it, right? We could train the slow ones to do that without having to make any change to the fast ones. Another advantage, but what's the main advantage of this approach? What was the main problem with this one? It's not scalable. It's not scalable, right? So over here, at least in this cartoon, these fast neurons can exhibit three different patterns. Maybe we could keep training the fast ones to add a fourth pattern, and a fifth one, and a sixth. Not clear how many, but may, let's see how many fast patterns we can pack into this tangle of fast neurons and then train the conductor to stitch together different sequences of those basic behaviors. A much more scalable approach compared to, to this one over here. Okay, so I've been talking about fast and slow neurons. How would we make fast or slow neurons? Adjusting the tau. J adjusting the tau, exactly. Okay. We're not going to talk about this entire picture here. It's a little complicated. This is the CTRNN, the continuous neural network that was controlling that uh, humanoid robot. They fixed the values of the time constants of the taus in the neurons and then evolved the other 120 numbers. So they evolved the weights and they evolved the gains and they evolved uh, the biases. But they fix the taus here. Remember that a low value of tau means you have a more fast reacting neuron. A higher value of tau means you have slower reacting uh, neurons over here. And you can see that the fast neurons over here are directly connected to the input and output neurons. So this is the tangle of sensor and motor neurons over here. All right, I'm not going to go into any more detail about uh, the workings of this. This is sort of optional reading for today. Um, if you're interested in this kind of approach, it's a great paper to read. This was a very powerful result in evolutionary robotics because it suggested how we can exploit aspects of this neural network to finally start to develop generalist robots, robots that can learn or evolve the ability to do more and more things <laughs> and exhibit different sequences or versions of those things in different circumstances. Okay, last thing we'll say about uh, this project, which is kind of interesting. Here was a visualization of actually what one of these evolved networks were, was doing. So let's start up here. Each one of these panels, the, ver the horizontal axis is showing time, and the vertical axis here in this panel is showing the proprioceptive sensors, so this is the angle of the joints. 
during this period here, the robot had already reached out for, grabbed the object, and was lifting the object up and down three times. And we can see there are three, uh, three spikes here. So you can actually see the movement of the robot. Then it was asked to move the block back and forth, uh, left and right, three times. And you can see, again, three spikes as the robot actually does that. So up and down three times, then left and right three times, and then back to the home position. If you look down here, you can look at the fast neurons, and you can actually see, if you look carefully, there are three oscillations in the neuron values. So in this panel here, each row corresponds to one of the neurons, or I'm sorry, each, yeah, each row corresponds to one of the fast neurons, and we have time here. So this is not unlike the checkerboard patterns you were producing for assignment three. Black is the neuron is on, white is it's off. So you can see the fast neurons oscillating three times, which push <coughs> the motors to rotate back and forth three times. Then you can see that the neurons switch, into, fast neurons switch into a different pattern and produce three different oscillations, which corresponds to the left and right. This panel down here is showing the slow neurons, the conductor neurons, which are slowly changing across this motor primitive. But at least in this case, they're not really exhibiting any of these oscillations. So these neurons together are kind of saying, uh, lift the object up and down three times. Then you can see that they shift their pattern into a different pattern, and now they're telling the fast neurons, shake the block left and right three times. So we can actually see how the slower parts of the brain are affecting the faster parts of the, the brain. Turns out that if you try this experiment without the CTRNN, without these time constants, it's almost impossible to train the robot to learn A and B, and then exhibit A, then, then B. So this more complicated neural network has an advantage. There's something about being able to change the temporal dynamics, the speed of the neurons, and as well as the biases and uh, the thetas. OK, any questions about CTRNNs before we move on? OK. Let's move on to minimal cognition now. So in all the, we're going to talk about four experiments in lecture nine here. All of these robots were evolved with these CTRNNs. And we're going to look at four different building blocks of intelligence as we go. We're going to start with uh, affordances. This is an exceedingly important aspect of intelligence. When you look at an object, it often feels like you're looking at the geometry of the object and figuring out what the object is based on its geometry. So there's this big object here. It's got straight edges. It's got about this size. This is a, a desk. This has this particular shape. It's a chair. This has this particular shape. It's a student, and so on and so forth. Right? Remember, we talked about thinking about thinking is misleading. Turns out that usually what we're doing when you're looking at objects out in the world is not just paying attention to the geometry of the object, but the affordance of the object. And the affordance of an object is its advertisement of function. An, ob an object will afford an idea to you about how that object can be used. So I use this little, uh, these pictures here to give this idea some, some weight. So, uh, hopefully, you've all recognized what these things have in common. They're good to sit on. They're good to sit on, right? Now, whether you'd actually classify all of these as a chair, who knows, right? If I left this one out and I asked you what these four objects are, you'd probably tell me a chair. You would not have said things to sit on, right? Your mouth is, is telling chair, but your mind is thinking about if I were to interact with that object, what kinds of interactions are possible? Which kinds of interactions are useful to me? So there's a theory in uh, developmental psychology. Developmental psychology is how infants grow into adults. That children are learning about the world by figuring out how they can interact with objects, how they can use them to get 
something done, not just learning the geometry of, of the object. Okay. How do we actually learn about these affordances? That's still kind of mysterious. So let's look at, uh, oh, this is a nice example here. Okay, what do all these have in common? Same, uh, one of the objects is still the same. What do these objects all have in common? Energy, they provide energy. So obviously the way you think about a particular object, the kind of affordances that it suggests is based on context, right? So in this context, I'm forcing you to think about a particular kind of functionality that this object might afford to you or provide to you. Just uh, uh, something to think about when we think about affordances. They're, they're influenced by context. Okay. Okay. So let's look at a very minimal, very simple robot here. This is the, the Space Invaders robot here. It's going to move back and forth along the bottom of the screen. And we're going to evolve this robot to perceive, to, uh, to perceive a particular affordance, which is the relationship between itself and these objects. So when you think about an affordance, you can't think about the object itself. You have to think about the object and yourself, right? If you're thinking about, is that an object I can sit on, depends not only the size of the object, but the size of yourself, right? It's the, the interaction between you and the object that you're thinking about that allows you to think about the affordances of that object. How can it be of value to you? Okay, so we're going to evolve this robot here to uh, learn an affordance about these pairs of objects that are going to fall from above. And you can see that there's a little bit of a gap in this pair of blocks here. And we're going to drop pairs of blocks above this robot. And these pairs of blocks are either going to be further or closer together. And if the gap is wide enough for the robot to get through, then it should go through the gap. If the gap is too narrow, the robot should run away. So the affordance here, from the robot's point of view, is is this pair of blocks passable? Can I get through them? Is it threadable? Okay, so how did they evolve a robot to do this? They dropped, for each robot, and for each C tier and N, they dropped <coughs> num trials, they, they did a number of trials, and each time they calculated P sub I, which is the performance of the robot in trial number I. When uh, if the opening was too narrow for the agent to pass through, they use this fitness function. If the aperture was wide enough for the robot to get through, they used this fitness function. So there was an if statement in their fitness function. Let's look at this part here. The gap is too wide. What is this fitness function rewarding and what is it punishing? Don't run into the walls. Pretty, pretty straightforward, right? If you do run it, so if you don't hit the walls, you get 100 out of 100. That's the best you can do in this, this trial. Y two times absolute D sub I. If you do hit the wall, you don't get 0. You get 2 D I. Why? What are they selecting for in this case? So D sub I is the final horizontal separation between the center of the uh, agent and the center of the aperture when this pair of blocks finally gets to the ground. Why are you trying to maximize this term? So the farther you want right away, the higher score you get. Exactly. The worst possible thing you can do when the aperture is too narrow is be exactly under the blocks. You hit the blocks. D sub i is 0, because the horizontal separation between you and the pair of blocks is 0, and that's the worst possible thing you can do. If that neural network produces a randomly modified copy with a mutation in it, that neural network causes the robot to move slightly differently so that it still gets hit by the blocks, but D sub i is a little greater than 0 now. You get a little bit more fitness. So evolution is 
incrementally rewarding robots for uh, moving further away from the center until eventually they're not hit at all. Okay, if the aperture is wide enough for the robot to pass through, you get 100 points if the robot goes, uh, is in the aperture and does not hit the two blocks as they pass on either side of the robot. You get zero points if you ran away. So if you're overly uh, cowardly, you're going to get zero points. What about this term here? What is this term doing? How it rewards you for being closer to the center. Exactly, right? So we've got a negative di now. So the smaller di is, the closer d sub i is to zero, the more points you, you get. So even if you're hitting the blocks, as long as you're moving closer and closer to the center, the better you do. Okay, so they evolved a population of CTRNNs. For each CTRNN, they dropped it into the robot and they dropped pairs of objects from above multiple times. Sometimes the aperture was wide enough for the robot to get through, sometimes it was too narrow, and they looked to see how well the robot did at running away when the aperture was too narrow, and running towards and threading the gap when the aperture was wide enough. Here's a plot of how one of the evolved CTRNNs actually did. One of the nice things about the minimal cognition experiments is there's a whole num a bunch of figures which we're going to look at today and, and Tuesday that help to visualize the performance of a robot that's succeeding at the task. When you get to your final project and you're evolving your robots and you're thinking about figures to create to show us how well or how poorly your robot is doing, go back to this lecture. There's a lot of great ideas in here about how to visualize evolved performance. Okay, so they evolved these CTRNNs. They eventually got one that had very, very high fitness. They took that one evolved CTRNN out of the population, dropped it back in the robot hundreds of times now under lots of different conditions. Sometimes when the aperture was four units narrower than the width of the robot. Sometimes when the aperture was four units wider than the robot and sometimes when the aperture was exactly as wide as the robot. And they looked to see what was the final horizontal separation between the robot and the object. So if the final horizontal separation was zero, what does that mean? The robot was right under the pair, was centered under the pair of objects when the pair of objects hit the ground. Okay, what strategy evolved here? Is this robot doing perfectly well? <coughs> if you were this robot, is this the strategy you would adopt? One last thing I forgot to mention, these error bars here that you see are showing the variation. So at this particular point here, when the aperture was exactly as wide as the robot, they did it a whole bunch of times, and sometimes they put the pair of objects up here, sometimes here, sometimes here, sometimes here. They put it at different horizontal positions above the robot, so there was a whole bunch of different trials, even when the aperture was as wide as the robot. Sometimes it ran away, sometimes it approached, so they got a, uh, a wide range of behaviors. What's happening out here? What is the robot doing when the aperture is 0.1 uh, narrower than the, the robot? It's running away. It's always running away. And if the aperture is slightly wider than the robot, it's always running towards and threading the, the object. What's happening here? It's guessing, but you'll notice that uh, 
there's a point here to the right of the dotted line, not to the left of the dotted line. What does that mean? It's still running away it's sometimes when it's too, when it's wide enough. It's still running away when the aperture is actually wider, and even when the aperture is wide enough to get through, just wide enough to get through, it still runs away most of the time. So this is a slightly prudent robot, right? It says, uh, maybe it's, it's wide enough to get through. I'm not going to risk it. I'm just going to run away, which is probably a good thing to do, right? If you're not quite sure how big the aperture is, run away. OK. I'm sorry, there was one other thing I, I forgot to mention. How does the robot actually see the aperture, right? So if we go back to the cartoon up here, here's our robot that's able to move left and right along the bottom of the screen. So it has two motor neurons, one that pushes it to the left, one that pushes it to the right. And it has seven uh, distance sensors, so these rays that it's emitting out of its front. And when the block breaks one of these rays, it can register that. So there's seven sensor neurons which are returning the length of these beams at any given time. So the robot's vision is not that great, right? All it can see are these seven numbers. It doesn't have a full video image. So it might be that for a lot of the cases, it's kind of hard for the robot to actually determine exactly how big the aperture is. So if you're not sure, in robotics as in life, best to be prudent. OK. Here's some more interesting ones. Let's take exactly the same evolved C tier and N, and now we're going to expose it to a whole bunch of other different uh, conditions here. In this case, we're going to take a pair of objects and place them at the top of the screen at all of these different positions, and then the pair of objects are going to start to fall. Sometimes when they did this, the pair of objects were too close to one another for the robot to pass through. So here's when the aperture is narrower than the robot. They went back and dropped the pair of objects again from exactly the same initial positions at the top of the screen, but now the aperture was wide enough for the robot to get through. Each one of these lines is now showing how the robot reacted to that pair of objects. So the, uh, the horizontal position here, let's have a look at this line here to the far left. At this case, the pair of objects was 40 units to the left of the robot, which was at the bottom of the screen in the center. The, uh, the pair of objects started to fall. So you see that this line is more or less vertical. But when it gets here, the line becomes diagonal. What is that telling us? The pair of obstacles are always falling straight down, but the this trajectory now, the robot moved, right? So the trajectory starts to approach zero, which means the robot is moving towards the pair of objects that are falling, and the horizontal position or the horizontal difference between them is decreasing. Make sense? So whenever you see a vertical line, that means the robot is not moving. When you see a diagonal line, that means the robot is moving towards or maybe away from the obstacle. OK. Here are ob obstacles that it should run away from. Here are, obstacle, are objects that it should run towards. Tell me about this robot's behavior. What is it doing? It first tries to figure out what the size of the gap is. It first tries to figure out what the size of the gap is. How does it do that? It scans it, goes back and forth, and scans it with sensors, and then it makes a decision. And it runs away. OK. So it scans the gap, then it decides, then it goes towards or runs away, right? So remember, our robot has these seven uh, distance sensors. So by moving back and forth, it can sweep these distance sensors across the undersides of the objects, not unlike how a cat or a rat uses its whiskers to scrape against something and get some information from those objects. OK, so we can see that the robot is moving backwards and forwards, right? It, we don't have, a, well, we have a few lines, I guess, where it actually goes straight, but other cases where it goes back 
and forth before making a decision, right? It's kind of sweeping back and forth under the obstacle. Tyler told us that this robot is making a decision. It decides. When does it decide whether to run toward or run away? That's well, about 50. Somewhere away. around here. If you look at the picture above 50, in both of these, it looks almost exactly the same. And it's after that point when the behavior starts to, to change, right? Kind of interesting. We can say that the robot decided, but we have to put scare quotes around it, right? There's no decision circuit inside this robot. There's just our set of differential equations that have evolved to produce this, this behavior. You can see that the lines actually start to clump up into different subsets of lines. It's almost like the robot is coming up with subcategories, right? The aperture is really wide, or kind of wide, or narrow, or way too narrow. It's not treating every, every, different, every separate trajectory completely differently. It seems to be falling into a, a small subset of behaviors. Everybody see that? OK. The researchers who did these experiments, they were very systematic. So they, they continued on with this one evolved CTRNN. Now they did uh, tens of thousands of trials. And what they did was they started by looking at, by altering the initial horizontal position between the pair of objects and the robot, which is on the horizontal axis here. And the vertical axis here is the relative aperture width. So any pixel in this plot now corresponds to one trial with this evolved CTRNN. All right, let's try and parse this here. We can see that the robot didn't always succeed. Up here, it always seemed to succeed. But if we really zoom in now and try lots of different cases, it doesn't always do the right thing. The white pixels below zero, what is that telling us? The, the fact that the bottom half of this figure is all white, what does that mean? Made it through the gap. Most the time when it was less than zero? Not quite. What does a negative relative aperture width mean in this case? No, we're not not see. It's not that it can't see. The gap is too small. The gap, the gap is too small. So remember, the negative number here means that the aperture is two units narrower than the width of the, the robot. So all of the pixels below zero here correspond to trials in which the gap was too narrow for the robot to get through. What did the robot do in every single one of those cases? Ran away. It ran away, right? So white is good, it ran away. Remember, this is our, our paranoid robot, right? If the aperture is too small, it's out of there. OK. Most of the pixels on the upper half of the figure are also white, which correspond to what condition? The gap was very wide. The gap was very wide, and the robot went, went through it, right? Also, there are some cases down here, right, where, where the pixels are still white. So here, the gap was just a little bit bigger than the robot, and it still did the right thing. Um, I'm actually curious why, as the gap got larger, the robot had more trouble. Good question, right? So the gray pixels correspond to cases where the robot slammed into one of the two objects. It didn't run away, and it didn't successfully thread the gap. It wasn't quite sure what to do by the time the pair of objects got to the ground. Right? And you can see there are these huge areas in which it did so. Even when the gap was three or more units wider than the robot, seems strange. The black is even worse, right? The black is representing what? It did the worst possible thing it could do. Got hit by the object. Not got hit. That that's the gray object. Uh, the gray pixels. Ran away when it shouldn't have. It ran away when it when it shouldn't have, right? So every black pixel here, the aperture was wide enough for the robot to get through, and the robot ran away. So those big gray areas on the left and right. 
Is that because its initial position was so far away that it didn't have the same time to like measure whether or not it should stay? Maybe, but there's white here and there's white here. So it wasn't that the obstacles were too far away. Right? It did get towards the objects and thread between them for those horizontal positions, so that wasn't the problem. It's not surprisingly that the it's not surprising that the black pixels cluster just above the zero line, right? These this area here represents pairs of blocks for which the aperture was just wider than the robot. It had a hard time figuring out what to do and it ran away. Okay. Look at this line here. So when the pair of objects was immediately over the robot, right over the robot and started to fall, the robot always ran away, or ran away up to apertures of this, this width. This also seems kind of strange. So there are these systematic patterns or areas in which conditions under which the robot is doing the wrong thing. Why might this have occurred? It's not because the pair of objects is too far away and the robot can't get there. Think about how they were trained over here. What's going on here? I didn't tell you what num trials actually is, but it definitely wasn't 10,000 different conditions. It was a small subset of these conditions. I don't know how many actually they, they did, but it was on the order of 10 or, or 30 trials. We can probably guess from this picture that one of the trials that the robot never experienced during evolution was a pair of objects with a wide enough gap placed directly above the robot. The robot pr probably never saw these conditions during evolution. It probably never saw these conditions during evolution. We can't evolve every CTRN, every CTRNN under every possible condition, right? If num trials was equal to 10,000, we'd have to take every CTRNN in our population and evaluate each one 10,000 times and then go on to the next generation and evolve all of those CTRNNs, uh, or evaluate all those CTRNNs another 10,000 times, and so on. Right? We have to be selective. During evolution, we can only expose our robot to so many conditions, which means it's not going to generalize perfectly. Right? It's not going to get every case right. You can see that here. OK. But most of the time, this robot has been able to figure out affordances. Okay, let's move on to the second of our four building blocks of cognition. We just saw a robot that can start to evolve the ability to understand when it sees, quote unquote, a pair of objects. It understands the affordance being advertised by that, that pair of objects. Here's another one that seems kind of obvious to us, but is uh, not a trivial thing to do, which is to discriminate between self and everything else. Right? We saw BabyBot a few weeks back. BabyBot was able to start to figure out that this blob of motion in its visual field is actually its arm, or it's something that it can control, but other stuff that's moving is not self. Right? How did BabyBot do that? Well, let's look at a simpler case of a robot that does this. So here's a, a robot that's similar to the one that we just saw. This robot doesn't physically move, but it does have an arm and a little hand here, and it can rotate its arm uh, left and right in front of it. So this robot only has one motor neuron, which controls its arm rotating back and forth. We're going to drop single objects now from above, and they can fall downward at different angles. And in all of these cases, the object will eventually come into contact with the radius described by the hand. And what the robot has to do, the only thing the robot has to do, is move its hand so that its hand collides with the object when the object gets there. So it has to grab, quote unquote, the object. Pretty simple. The problem for this robot, as you can see in this cartoon, is obstacles that are objects that are falling break these distance sensors so it can see the objects. 
but it also sees its hand. Its hand is also breaking these beams. Imagine now that the object is almost on top of the robot. How is it to know that this, this beam that's, that's being broken here is being broken by the object or by non-self, or that beam is being broken by self? How can it distinguish between these things? Make sense? OK. All right, let's have a quick look at the fitness function here. There's actually a typo in the equation in the paper. It should be a min rather than a max. And again, they're going to expose each C tier and N to a number of trials and calculate the performance of the robot in these different trials. <clears throat> We're going to use theta sub i to represent the angular error, error at the end of the ith trial. So what is the angle of the arm at the end of the trial? And what is the angle of the, of the object? That, that's theta. What are we trying to do to theta in this fitness function? Make it zero. Make it zero, right? We're trying to minimize it. You can see that there's a negative uh, theta sub i there. Yes? How would this work for embodying the robot as a physical robot, like rather than anticipation? Good question. So again, remember with BabyBot, there were things that were impinging on its sensorium. So there were things that it was seeing. And for, for that robot, they were just blobs of motion, right? It doesn't know the meaning of the things that it's seeing yet. All it knows is that some of these things are me and some of these things are not me. And it's kind of tricky to disambiguate between these things. That's what we're investigating here, but we're doing it in a very, very simple robot. So we can try and understand if we evolve a robot that can distinguish between self and non-self, we can, we can try and figure out exactly how it's doing it. I meant literally like getting the arms so that it just sticks to the, to the object, you know. Like oh, how would we make this as a physical machine? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know, but it would be a good thing to think about. Okay. Yeah, good, good question. Okay, so like before, they evolved, uh, they evolved these robots over time, and at the end of an evolutionary run, they took the best C tier and N, the one with the highest fitness, pulled it out of the population, dropped it back into the robot, and now exposed it to a whole bunch of different conditions. So they arrange these conditions in the final way. So what was the final object angle? So they dropped a whole bunch of objects from above, and they recorded where on this circumference the object hit. So was it minus 90 degrees, or plus 90 degrees, or, or zero? Actually, it was much a uh, much smaller range of angles than that. That was the basic idea. So where, relative to the robot, did the object hit? And where, relative to the robot, was the arm? Was the arm at zero degrees? Right in front of the robot, was it negative or was it positive? Okay. What can you tell me about the performance of this robot under those conditions? Yes? It's pretty good. It's doing pretty well, right? So usually the angle of the, of the hand corresponds to the angle of the object. It's manning, managing to grab it at that position in all these, these cases. You can see that the error bars here are a little larger. So again, what do the error bars represent? Well, they dropped an object, a whole bunch of objects that hit right in front of the robot at angle zero, but they fell from above from different initial conditions. So they were coming at the front of the robot from different angles, and it did better or worse in some of those cases. So it turns out that when the object hit right in front of the robot, it did a little bit worse than when it hit somewhere else. Given our discussion about our affordance detecting robot, why do you think that's the case? Um, well, it's possible that the places it contracts a little bit are areas where it's not directly blocking a, a vision sensor, and the places where it's a bit wider, maybe the object was running around or very close to one of those sensors, so the robot had harder time distinguishing. It could be, right? It could be that things that come in and hit in the front cross fewer beams, or they're kind of harder to see, or it's a little bit more confusing. It's probably a little of that. 
And also, they probably didn't have that case in when they were evolving the, the robots. Right? Maybe something close, but not quite. OK, this one takes a little bit to digest, so we'll take a little bit of time with, with this one. Same thing, they're going to play back the same evolved CTRNN under different conditions. And this picture, like the one we saw before, is going to show us how exactly the robot was behaving as the ob object was falling. OK, so um, you can see that down here there's angles between minus pi over 8 radians and plus pi over 8 radians. Zero here is going to represent the, uh, the robot grabbing the object right at right in front of it at zero. So the fact that all of these trajectories can converge on zero mean they drop the object from a whole bunch of positions and the object hit in front of the robot and the robot more or less got its arm directly in front of itself and caught the object. Okay. You'll notice that at the top here there are two sets of lines. These two sets of lines correspond to two things they did to the robot. Just before they dropped the object, they took the robot's arm and they cranked it all the way to minus pi over 8. Then they dropped the obstacle and the robot could start moving its arm. Or they grabbed the robot's arm and cranked it all the way to positive pi over 8 radians. And then they dropped the pair of object. So these two, these two sets of trajectories starting up here is when the robot is extended all the way, initially extended all the way to the left, or extended initially all the way to the right. So far so good? Okay. The, the color of any one trajectory, the gray, grayness of that line, represents the initial angle of the object. So if the object was dropped at pi minus 8 radians relative to the robot, it, the object started there and fell down towards the robot until the object hit right in front of the, the robot. So far so good? Okay. The initial position of the line, what was the angle of the robot's arm, the color of the line, what was the relative angle of the object just before it was let go. So black trajectories that you can see over here, you can see over here, this correspond to objects that were dropped up into the left of the robot. These lighter trajectories here are objects that were dropped uh, up into the right of the robot. OK, what's the robot doing? We're scanning like the last one. It's definitely scanning back and forth quite a bit. Why is it scanning so much? What's the advantage of scanning here? What does So active scanning helps the robot distinguish between self and non-self in exactly the same way that BabyBot distinguished between the moving blob in its field of view and the fruit that we put in front of it. What is it about active scanning that helps it distinguish self from non-self? It knows its motor is firing. It knows that its motor is firing. So when it sees that movement, it knows that that's self. Exactly. So this is actually called sensor motor contingency. And we'll see this quite a bit as we go forward. So it's established, it's creating a sensor motor contingency. When I move my motor, I see changes on my sensors. The beams break and unbreak as I send commands to my motor. So those breakings and reformings of the beam, that's because of my hand. If I'm not moving the motor, or I've moved my motor and these beams are breaking over here, and these are the beams that I know correspond to my hand. Wait a second, there's a beam way over here that just broke. Therefore, that must be the object. The object is over here. Back I go. Okay. What else can you tell me about what the robot is doing here? What kind of strategy has it evolved?
Is it exhibiting a completely different behavior for every different initial condition? <coughs> No, it's I mean, it's uh, exhibiting basically the same one, but from different starting points. So you have to, you know, testing out where it is, and then honing in on it. Uh, but it doesn't matter if it starts like over here or over here. Exactly. So let's look at these over here. The arm is all the way to the left, and ob objects are falling from lots of different relative angles. The arm is off to the left. The robot sweeps its arm even further to the left and then sweeps it back again to this point. It's swept to the left and right across its visual field. And then at this point in time, there's a bifurcation. It starts to now sweep its arms in different directions. And you can see that it sweeps its arm this way for the black lines, this way for the gray lines, which correspond to objects falling from different directions. In all these cases, the robot could actually just take its arm and go right to the center and then wait for the object to, to get there. Right? Doesn't, doesn't do that. Whatever it's doing, it's much more complicated than that. And there seem to be specific points in time where the robot makes, quote unquote, a decision about which angle the object is approaching from. What's happening over here? Look at the black lines here and the gray lines over here. What's happening during these time points? So the black lines mean that the object is off to the left. It's coming in from the left towards the center. What's the arm doing? It's sort of lining up its and then the falling object. It's lining up its hand underneath the object, right? It's pointing its hand at the object and sweeping back and forth, right? So it's sweeping back and forth. It's got this sensor motor contingency. When I move, these beams break, but they're also beams that are breaking over here, right? It's almost like it's looking at the thing and trying to distinguish between its hand and its object and the object at the same the same angle. Kind of interesting. Okay, now again, this is just one evolved CTRNN. If we went back to the beginning and re-evolved another successful CTRNN, would it do exactly this? Probably not. There's probably other strategies that, that work. Okay, all right, let's look at the third, a third building block of intelligence. If you want to be intelligent, one of the things you have to do is remember, right? So let's look at short-term, uh, a robot that evolves short-term memory. We know that these robots have CTRNNs. These CTRNNs have a 10 by 10 weight matrix inside, which means there are recurrent connections in there. Some of the neurons are attached to, e uh, the neurons are attached to each other. Recurrent connections give us the ability, uh, give the robot the ability to form memories. And let's see whether it can exploit them. <coughs> All right, we're back to our Space Invaders robot that can move left and right along the bottom of the screen. Again, we're going to drop uh, objects from above. And the trick in this case, our robot again has its seven, uh, its seven distance sensors. The moment the robot starts moving, we turn off the sensors. So the, the moment it starts moving, it goes blind. And the trick here, like before, is the robot is going to have to move and stop exactly where the object hits. So capture the object. But to get there, it can't see the object. So it's going to have to remember how the object was falling and make a prediction about where the object is going to hit the ground and be at that position when it does so. Sound good? OK. Fitness function is very straightforward in this case. Uh, again, we're going to do a whole bunch of trials, and we want to try and minimize the distance between the robot and the object when the object hits. OK. They evolved a population of CTRNNs to do this. They took the best evolved CTRNN out of the population at the end of the evolutionary run, dropped it back into the robot, and executed that robot under a whole bunch of initial conditions. And here's how it did. 
Okay. So horizontal axis, this was the final position along the bottom of the screen where the object hit. And this is where the robot was at the bottom of the screen when the object hit. How did this evolved CTRNN do? Fairly well, but not that well around the zero. Same thing we've seen before, right? So most of the time, whatever the final object position was, was exactly the same as the robot. The robot captured it, right? Any point that falls along this diagonal line, that represents a successful catch. Any line that deviates, any point that deviates from this line represents an unsuccessful catch. So for objects that were falling and hit at the center of the bottom of the screen, Sometimes the, object, the robot was a little bit too far to the left or a little bit too far to the right. And also, when the object fell just at the edge of the bottom of the screen, the robot also did not do such a great job. Okay. This one may be for the same reason we saw before. Maybe it never actually saw that condition during evolution. What about these cases out here at the edge? Okay. Same thing, same evolved CTRNN. Now they placed a whole bunch of objects at the top of the screen, and each one of those objects started falling perfectly vertically, falling straight down. And now the robot could start to move left and right to get underneath that object. So like we saw before now, a perfectly vertical line shows that the object is falling and the robot is not moving. The, rope, the moment that vertical line starts to go diagonal, that's the moment that the robot starts moving, hopefully towards uh, the object. What can you tell me about this CTRNN's behavior? It doesn't really seem to be stopping and looking again. Ah, it doesn't stop and look. That's because even if it does stop, we don't turn the sensors back on. The moment you start moving, you go completely blind and you can't ever use your sensors again. So that's the reason why it doesn't start and stop. Right? Now that doesn't mean that it couldn't exhibit a complex movement trajectory to get there, but we don't see that in this case. What is it, how is the robot moving in all these initial conditions? slowly and continuously towards the object. Right? What else can you tell me about this evolved CTRNN's behavior? The closer it is, the longer it takes to stop. That's it, right? So it seems that it's come up with a strategy that it always moves at the same velocity. You notice all these diagonal lines have the same slope. So it's not the case that the robot says, Okay, the minute I figure out where the object is going to hit, I'm going to start moving. And if it's further away, I'm going to move fast. And if it's close, I'm going to move slow. It did not hit on that strategy. It says, all right, I'm always going to move at the same speed. But the time at which I start moving is going to be dictated by where the object is. The closer the object is to me, the longer I wait until I start to move which is pretty good. Why is, that, why is that kind of easy for this robot? Think about its sensors and think about its, C, its CTRNN. Why is that a good strategy? Um, so in the case of velocity, uh, you have to be considering the timing and the velocity. There'd be two factors because you're not going to make your decision right away. And go. You'd say like, okay, now it's going to be here, and now I'm going to move this fast. That's so it. With, with timing, you only have to consider one. And um, yeah, I'm actually amazed that like it was as good as it as it got. You know. Uh, that's true, yes, yeah. So remember that evolution is lazy, right? So easier to just have the motor neuron that moves the robot left and right to always output the same constant velocity, and you trigger that motion 
at some certain case. Now there's another hint here if you look at this picture. Look at this cone and look at the spread of the sensors. Oops, sorry. When does the robot start moving? When it can't see it anymore. When it can't see it anymore, right? I've got my seven beams and the beams are being broken and I'm not moving. So I, I know it's non-self, it's the, it's the object. And the moment the object falls outside of the cone, then I'm going to start moving, either to the left if it's over to the left, or over to the right when it's to the right. And it's a nice hack, right, because that's it. When it falls outside the cone, that's when you should start moving. The earlier it falls outside the cone, the further away it is, and the earlier you should start moving. So evolution is exploiting this relationship between movement, distance, sensors, velocity, and it's come up with a pretty simple rule. We could probably boil this evolved CTRNN down to three or four lines of code, right? Detect the object. When you no longer detect the object, then, then move. And remember on which side, right? And away you, away you go. Pretty nice, easy solution. Okay, works most of the time, but you'll notice that with the gray lines there, there are certain cases when it doesn't do very well. This one in the center here, we've already talked about. They, they probably didn't include that during evolution. What's happening out here in these edge cases when it misses the object? Why does it miss the object in these cases? It started outside its, its cone. That may be the case. It's kind of hard to tell from this picture. It might have been outside the cone, or it may have just been in its field of view for one time step, or maybe two time steps, enough to figure out which side it's on, which of my two, le which of my leftmost or my rightmost beams was broken, and just head in that direction. But I'm not exactly sure where it was. A little, there wasn't enough time for me to watch the object falling to determine exactly where it is, so I didn't quite get there in time or I overshot the object by a little, a little bit. Make sense? Okay. Okay. Uh, again, another analysis here. Final object position, so where did the object fall at the bottom of the screen? Where was, the, uh, where was the final agent's position? And like we've seen before, not really doing a great job for things that are falling directly in front of it and things that are off far to the left or the, the right. Kind of difficult. OK. This one's kind of interesting here. Same CTRNN, but now the objects are not falling straight down. In this picture, they're placed at these positions at the top of the screen, and now they all fall with an angle a little bit to the right. Now we see what? What is the robot doing in this case? Same CTRNN, different set of initial conditions, and suddenly a different strategy emerges. Sort of moves with it, and then it starts to zero in back and forth. It, so it's moving back and forth, but it's not zeroing in because remember, as it's moving, it cannot see the object. So the object is triggering this back and forth motion. And it's back and forth motion and not smooth motion because it must, these diagonally falling objects must have triggered breaking and reforming of the beams in a different pattern than when they were falling straight down. So the different movement of the objects is now causing different kinds of movement in the robot. This is kind of interesting, right? So if you're placed in one environment, you exhibit one behavior. You're placed in a different environment, you exhibit a different behavior. Thinking about thinking is misleading, right? We might imagine that we have different parts of our brain that are producing these different behaviors for these different initial conditions. But like we saw for the humanoid robot that was shaking the block, that may not be the case. The exact same neural network producing different movement strategies when exposed to different conditions. 
You can see that it's the spread down here is pretty wide compared to when the object <coughs> was falling straight down, which tells us what? Look at the spread at the bottom of those figures compared to the spread at the bottom of this figure. It's a little bit wider, showing that the robot is having a little bit harder of a time with these objects that are falling at an angle. Okay, I think we will stop there. We'll talk about the fourth and final building block of cognition on Tuesday. Uh, you have a quiz due tonight, and assignment five is due Monday night. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you.